So welcome to In The Zone, a podcast from uh, the Middle East Treaty Organization focused on how we can uh, reduce the attraction and get rid of weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East. Today, I'm talking to Adina Esfandiuri, Senior Advisor to the MENA Programme at the International Crisis Group. We're going to be talking about the zone, politics in the Middle East and uh, where where there might be uh, lines of hope. But before we start, Dina, um, I've introduced you, but um, tell me a bit about who you are and why you got involved in this uh, arena. Sure. Um, thanks for having me, Paul, first of all. So I am a researcher, an analyst on uh, all things Middle East with a particular focus on Iran and the Gulf Arab states. I've done a lot of work on non-proliferation uh, as well and, and a lot of work generally on regional security. My background is that I'm originally Iranian, which I guess is how I got into being interested in this stuff. And I initially started my, uh, my career focusing on Iran. Uh, and then naively thought after 2015, when the nuclear deal was signed, that, hey, maybe I can expand my horizons a little bit and, and think a little bit about the Gulf Arab states and what their security concerns are and hopefully work towards bridging the divide between them. So I'm glad I did it, but it was definitely a, a naive move at the time. Um, I, I, I wonder if, um, if there are that there are dimensions here uh, that are particularly problematic around the Middle East, or, or, or do you think that this is more of a perception and that actually many of the challenges facing the Middle East are, are, are just similar to other parts of the world, but uh, we just have this prejudice or this, this, this view that the Middle East is particularly dysfunctional? I think it's probably a little bit of both. I think there is an element of the region not being too different to any other regions. I mean, if you look at like a, if you look at a country like Iran, for example, uh, we often single it out and and think that it's a particularly ideological regime that you know is in pursuit of of regional hegemony, and that may be true. But it's also a country that is intent on defending its borders, securing its people, ensuring that if there are threats to it, that they are as far away from it as possible. Um, and, and most of the countries in the Middle East in that respect are, are, are the same. So I think in that respect, it's not too different than, than other regions. Where it is probably unique is that it has this weird mix of different sects, different ideologies. And I think those contribute to tensions being particularly bad and particularly difficult to fix. What do you think, when, when people come to try and fix these challenges, what, what do you think are the biggest errors they make, particularly in respect to Iran and the Gulf states? It's a good question. So I'm going to look at it from the perspective of uh, maybe U.S. presence in the region, because I would argue that's the one that's been the most significant in terms of, you know, coming in with a view to, to trying to fix problems and eventually making them a lot worse. I think what the U.S., the mistake the U.S. makes is that there's a lot of, I guess, assuming that the actors in the region are going to act a certain way. In some respects, there's a little bit of mirror imaging. So they're going to do the same as us if we were in that situation. And in other respects, they'll automatically assume that the countries in the region will do the polar opposite of what the United States would do if it were faced with the same either constraints yeah. or threats. And often, I think they're completely off. Uh, again, I, the countries in the region are both similar and very dissimilar to Western countries. And, and I think there's just a lack of understanding of how they function, the way they think, the, the calculations they make, the decisions they make. There's an assumption that often they're always ideological. I think that's incorrect. They may be in some cases, but often they're quite pragmatic and in pursuit of very logical interests when it comes to their foreign policy. Um, and I think we tend to get that wrong when, when we don't know the region very well. Iran has a number of major threats to its existence and, and uh, uh, ideologically, territorially uh, and, and the rest. But at the same time, as you say, it's not accurate to just simply think that they're going to act in the same way as the Americans would. In fact, in many respects, the Americans can be more belligerent and, and more ready to uh, resort to threat or the, uh, or the threat of the use of force or the use of force itself. Um, which which means that there's a lot of miscalculation. And I don't quite know how you move from there if the 
normal, uh, quotes normal, approach of empathy actually leads you in the wrong direction or, or leads you to overstate, overestimate the threat because people are not like you. Absolutely. Um, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's the main reason why a lot of people struggle to do to make good policy when it comes to the Middle East. Though, to be fair, I would say one thing. I think often us Middle Easterners also don't get it right. <laughs> you know, the fact that we're from the region doesn't necessarily mean that we know exactly what's going on because we too are prone to miscalculation and misjudgment uh, and misunderstanding of, of the way decision makers in the region work. Because ultimately, yes, some of it is down to logic, but also a lot of it is down to um, personalities and egos and the way leaders in the region envision um, their foreign policy, their region uh, and their country in the region. So I think that also plays into it. In terms of finding a solution to it, I think, again, ultimately, the only way that you can do that is increase exposure to, to the countries in the region, to the languages, to the cultures, and, uh, and try to understand them better, because that will give you a bit of a gut feeling for the way that they make policy and the way they think and, and the way that they make decisions, which is part of some of the work that I've tried to do not so much with the with the US and the Europeans, because I think plenty of people do good work there, but particularly with regards to, to increasing face time between Iran and the Gulf Arab countries to ensure that they get used to seeing one another, talking to one another, being in the same room as one another, even if conversations don't go anywhere, because a lot of the time it's more about chest thumping and highlighting your positions. I think ultimately, this is a region where dialogue for the sake of dialogue is actually quite useful. Um, and in the long run, it'll help. Yes, I mean, one of, one, of, one of the times you and I have spent most time together is traveling around the Gulf states, uh, talking about nuclear power and nuclear safety and security. And, you know, while, whilst the world itself has been heavily involved in Iran's uh, nuclear program because of the fears of proliferation concerns, very few people seem to have got involved in nuclear safety and security. And, and the Iranians and the Gulf states share an intimate interest in ensuring that uh, nuclear reactors do, don't go up in a, a puff of smoke or there's a massive accident and, and, and the like, because they all share the same water. Uh, so, so there is a there is a an opening there for uh, a dialogue on nuclear safety and security between uh, those countries because both Iran and the Gulf states are pursuing nuclear energy. Um, it hasn't taken off. Why? Why do you think that's the case? What's What's getting in the way of uh, just an open and honest dialogue on on nuclear safety and security? So, I think you're absolutely right. It really is one area in which we could have a very fruitful dialogue between Iran and the Gulf Arab states. I think it hasn't taken off for a number of reasons. I think initially, before 2015, um, it was impossible to talk about because the only thing that everybody could talk about was Iran's you know, nuclear program to begin with. That was the barrier to any conversation with Iran, whether it be nuclear, foreign policy, any anything. So there was a there was this understanding that you had to get rid of this initial wall, this initial barrier before you could even contemplate talking about anything else, especially if that something else was going to be something nuclear focused. So that was the first reason. After 2015, the focus became how do we implement the deal and how do we ensure that everybody implements the deal properly? And Iran was a little bit focused on ensuring that it would get the benefits from the nuclear deal, which ultimately it didn't really get, at least not from the US. And the Gulf Arab states were in this waiting period where they were kind of waiting to see what would happen. Um, they were a bit more open to uh, talking to Iran, not least of all because they wanted to establish channels of communication to, to de-escalate uh, in the event that Iran would kind of lash out in the region because it had signed on to the nuclear deal, which of course it did. But they couldn't really bring themselves to, to actually do it because there was also internal problems within their countries in terms of, you know, making a decision to engage Iran and how to do that. And were, was this the right time or did they have to wait until they were in a stronger position? And so they ended up having this kind of wonky policy where they were like, we're happy to talk to Iran. But the first thing Iran has to do is unilaterally disengage from all Arab countries in the region as a precondition to those talks, which of course was absolutely unacceptable from Tehran's perspective. So you found yourself in this situation where you couldn't have dialogue. 
And then came Trump's maximum pressure campaign on Iran. The campaign was intended to get Iran back to the negotiating table to get a bigger and better deal. But ultimately, all it did was push Iran to actually lash out quite aggressively in the region, which frightened the Gulf Arab states, even though they supported Trump's maximum pressure campaign. And so it became difficult to have dialogue then because Iran was too busy being a nuisance in the region to prove to everybody that when cornered, it would react. So the one upside, I would argue, of this maximum pressure campaign is that it really did put in place this environment of fear. There was genuine worry on the part of the Gulf Arab states when they saw that it wasn't really leading to any of the things that they wanted. Iran wasn't any more contained or deterred uh, than it was before the campaign. And so they decided to take uh, matters into their own hands and started to pursue uh, forms of dialogue with Iran in a very limited manner, only to de-escalate and to ensure that things wouldn't get out of hand, which is kind of where we are today. So I think that to get this dialogue on nuclear safety and security, I do think that we're in an environment where regional dialogue is seems to be more likely because the parties in the region are more willing to do it. I do think we probably have to wait until there's a clear roadmap on the part of the um, world powers in Iran in terms of, you know, getting back into the nuclear deal and implementing it. I think once that's done, there's going to be a real desire to um, have a regional dialogue on multiple fronts. And I think nuclear safety and security is going to be is going to be top of the pack. I think it's a major concern for the Gulf Arab states. As you said, they share the same water but also a a range of other reasons. Iran is the only country in the world that operates a nuclear power plant and isn't party to the Nuclear Safety Convention. The waters in the Persian Gulf tend to flow in the direction in which they would end up bringing a leak closer to the Gulf Arab state capitals um, than to to Iran. Um, Same thing for winds in the region. So there's there's a genuine worry on the part of the Gulf Arab states that we kind of have to find a way to increase transparency and best practices in nuclear safety. So I do think there's scope for that. I think we can make it happen. I do think, however, that we kind of have to wait and see what happens with the nuclear deal first uh, and then jump on the bandwagon to make it happen. And it's interesting that more recently this, this dialogue you talk about seems to have come about without the involvement of Washington and uh, external, uh, external states, uh, which to my mind is, I mean, if, if it's true, <laughs> uh, to my mind is a, is a positive sign because it demonstrates that regional states are, are willing to actually take the initiative rather than constantly wait for outsiders to, uh, to lead. Um, yeah, that's, is, that, is that your sense as well? That's absolutely right. Yeah, for sure. I think I think that's that's some great news, actually. I think that if you're going to have lasting peace and security in the region, ultimately, it has to come from the states in the region who have to feel responsible uh, for the pursuit of their own security. I do think that any long running process on regional security, long running dialogue or forum or whatever you want to call it, will have to have the U.S. is OK, uh, not because Iran requires it, but I think because the Gulf Arab states require it, because for them, their relationship with the United States is very, very important. Uh, and they have a tendency to want to internationalize regional security, whereas Iran wants to make sure it is a product of the region. So ultimately, you're going to have to have a, U- a U.S. OK for the process. And I think it, it's not a bad idea for European states to get involved to help put in place the conditions for this kind of dialogue to occur and and um, to help maintain some of the momentum once it does take off. But I think it should be something that's convened by the region. I think that uh, countries like Oman and Kuwait are pretty well placed to be the conveners of, uh, of uh, this kind of dialogue. Uh, and while there will be stakeholders outside of the region that should be involved in it. Ultimately, the topics should be chosen by countries in the region, the discussions should be led by countries in the region, and the result should be the the responsibility of countries in the region. That's the only way you're going to have uh, any kind of lasting forum and lasting peace. 
Well, let's 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 focus a bit on uh, the zone itself, uh, the WMD free zone proposal. Um, now, in in other parts of the world where nuclear weapon free zones have been created, it has been the initiative of uh, regional states uh, in those parts of the world that have uh, initiated and driven the process of creating these uh, nuclear weapon free zones in the Middle East. Um, we've got this proposal that has been about since 1974, long time. <laughs> <laughs> to get to where we've got to, which is not very far so far. Plenty of reasons for uh, feeling um, uh, despair or frustration with, uh, with the lack of progress. But, um, but do you have any sense of po- positive optimism when it comes to the zone? Or is it, or is it a distraction from the, from the more immediate concerns of the JCPOA and other issues? So I don't think it's a distraction. I think it's a worthwhile endeavor and there is support for it amongst different parts of um, uh, the region. I just think that it should be something that is pursued alongside all other avenues for for de-escalation, whether it's, you know, security related, soft security related, JCPOA related. I think, I really think that it's it's a region that is so marred by tensions that everything has to be tackled at the same time and no issue the 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 resolution of no issue should be contingent on something else working now i know i I realize this goes against what i was saying earlier where i said i do think there needs to be a resolution to the to the current jcpoa issue but that's because the international community has made that the number one priority once that's taken off the table i do think it it opens up possibilities to talk about a range of other issues so I think the Middle East WMD free zone is worth pursuing. I know that there are different people in the region that think it, it would be a good way to ensure A, de-escalation and B, uh, dialogue and obviously C, help you know, with regional security because you're getting, getting rid of a significant category of problematic weapons, let's put it that way. The problem is the political will to get it done. The combination of barriers, things like, for example, Israel's nuclear arsenal, or obviously Iran's pursuit of a civilian program, but in the past, uh, a military program. I mean, these things make it really difficult because you kind of have to have everybody at the table. Now, there was a proposal to have a sub-regional WMD free zone um, that would involve Iran and the Gulf Arab states, but I think it's really difficult for the countries in that sub-region to agree to that. When in the wider region, there are still some countries that have a that have a nuclear arsenal. Um, when you talk to Iranian officials, for example, that is the first thing they get stuck on. How, how are we to do anything when Israel has an arsenal? And in fact, it's actually quite tiresome. It literally is the only thing they bring up every time uh, you try to have a discussion with them on on WMDs in the region. So. It makes it a little bit difficult. And then you have the chicken and egg issue. Do we resolve regional tensions first and then get to talking about a zone? Or do we talk about the zone uh, and hope that that works towards resolving other regional tensions in the in the region? I obviously don't have the answer to that. I think uh, if I did, um, the world would be better off. But I, I think that's why I go back to saying, look, it's just easiest if we tackle everything at once. So I do think it's worth pursuing, but I, I, I also think that it's it's difficult to keep pursuing something where you don't really see the light at the end of the tunnel. And with the zone right now, I certainly don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. There were two, there were two things I wanted to pick up on, and what you just said there. The first uh, around choreography, uh, regional security first or WMD first. And of course, that's 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 always the debate uh, between Israel and the Arab world. It was it was true of Acres and and previous attempts. You talk about tackling all issues at once, but 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 all issues in a tied way. Uh, formally tied it makes it incredibly complex but but could you not tackle all issues in parallel processes where i guess the linkages would be more informal and may arise in, in a sort of negotiation uh, give and take way tran- a transactional way oh absolutely um, that's exactly what i propose that's exactly what i propose i actually think that there should be no linkages because if you start to formally link 
different topics together, then inevitably you're just you're shooting the, the process in the foot before it's even gotten started. Um, so I think that's a terrible idea. I think that if you say we're doing all of this at once and you make progress on one file and another file gets stuck, but that these two files aren't linked, inevitably the fact that you've made progress in one file will somewhat lighten the mood in, in other files, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, because people will realize that actually both sides are willing to either compromise or make progress on various issues. It's not like they have a, you know, ideological blockage with regards to dealing with the country that they're dealing with. So it's more the issue that's difficult or the co some of the compromises are difficult. So I think that, uh, I think that actually working on multiple issues, making sure that they're not linked formally, but that progress in one file might positively impact progress in another file, I think that's the only way that you can you can make this process work. The other thing that came up uh, was um, the question you get fired at every time by Iranian officials, um, why should we talk about WMD when, uh, when Israel has a nuclear arsenal? <laughs> I'm intrigued because I've also had this uh, fired at many, many times. What's your answer? Honestly, <laughs> I, yes. they tell me that as well. I genuinely don't know what to answer. There, there is no good answer to that question because any their takeaway is always going to be right. But the only way to do it then is to, to develop a program in secret, keep it in secret, never announce it. And, and then clearly no one's going to force us to ever do anything. So there is no good answer to that question, I think. Um, the only way to tackle it is to say, you know, you're trying to uh, find security for yourselves. This is going to be a very difficult long-term process and you have to start somewhere. Uh, and there is nothing negative in it for you to have a conversation about WMDs in the region. It doesn't hurt you in any way. We're just talking uh, to see if there are any areas of overlap or areas of compromise that we can that we can reach. I think ultimately that's the only way to approach it, really. Uh, you could potentially create, as we said earlier, unofficial linkages to other areas and say, look, if you have a conversation about this, kind of like creating a little bit of a quid pro quo, if you have a conversation about this, then maybe you can get the party on the other side to, to lessen you know, whatever, their attacks on your ships and tankers in the Mediterranean, for example, or, or something, something like that. Um, but I'm wary of doing that on the WMD free zone. I think that's, I think looking for quid pro quos in regional security on very specific tactical issues is not a bad idea, um, but that favors de-escalation. The d pursuit of a WMD free zone, again, is a very long-term endeavor and it's difficult to find quid pro quos for that. So the only way to kind of motivate people to do it is just to say, look, there's, there's nothing bad in this. Sit down, have a conversation, um, see where it goes. Uh, and, and try to find areas of overlap. Um, but I don't have a good answer to that question, I'm not going to lie. Well, there, there, there may be a reason for that, that there, there is no good answer, but there are lots of uh, reassuring answers, or as you say, um, uh, room, room for improvement rather than solution in the process. Mm. I, I, I mean, it frustrates me when people don't realise the, the negative impact upon their position uh, when they fall into the trap of uh, of escalating themselves mm -hmm. or they can be seen as escalating the situation and uh, and they just they just seem to see that as an as an inevitable problem when you're dealing with states like the US uh, and even the Europeans mm. and uh, and the truth of it is is that this is a long term game isn't it it's it's a long term game where if, if we just take steps in the right general direction, then things can open up uh, in, in a positive way. Absolutely. But the problem is, you know, um, some countries in the region, not all, but some countries in the region have the same problem that, that Western countries have, which is that uh, governments are not long term looking. They're, uh, they're very short term looking. Um, you know, when Iran has a change in government every four to eight years, uh, and, and it kind of mirrors the American process where if it's the conservatives that are in power, then it becomes more difficult to deal with Iran. But there's probably a greater likelihood that any deal that you get to with them will be maintained. Whereas if it's a more moderate government, then dealing with them is easier from the perspective of the world powers. 
but deals uh, may not be as lasting or or end, end up being a little bit weaker because people are you know looking to to tear them apart inside the country which by the way is like i said incredibly similar to the us political scene so that yes. makes it it makes it really difficult to to think long term to plan long term for countries like the gulf arab monarchies it's a little bit easier because they don't have to deal with these fluctuations um, in their political space every few years. There tends to be more longevity in the, in the political space, which means they can think a little bit more long-term. The problem is that their security concerns and their fears are very short-term. And so, again, it's difficult for them to think uh, way ahead because they're more focused on how do we tackle the problems, the security concerns that we're facing today with this context of this perceived rising Iran um, or and the you know, U.S. pivoting away from the region. And these are all very immediate problems that we have to deal with. And we don't really have time to think about the long term while we're dealing with them. I've got a final question for you, which which is relevant to that, given that governments, many governments have to pay attention to uh, domestic audiences and often that's where the problem is. What, what role do you see in the region for civil society? I mean, I think civil society in the region is hugely important, whether it's, you know, pursuing uh, things like human rights within the countries, a better governance, or even, even on foreign policy issues. Uh, the problem is it's an important group of people um, in some cases, it's actually quite vibrant as well, but countries in the region tend to put a lid on it and not let them express themselves as freely as they would like to. Uh, so there's definitely a role for them, but for them, it's a bit of an uphill battle. Uh, it's never it's never really easy for them to express what they want, how they want it, and, and to contest some of the decisions that governments make in the region. So it isn't easy, not at all. Mm, sure. Do you think there's a role specifically that could be played in relation to the zone itself. If we look at some of the civil society movements in uh, Europe during the Cold War that played some kind of role in raising awareness of the dangers of nuclear war, you have those big peace demonstrations and the like. Do you, th do you think there's a possibility that the public in the Middle East might be able to rise above the the squabbles and say, look, you know, we've got squabbles here, but we really, we really do need to get WMD out of the equation because uh, it's dangerous. So I don't think you're going to like my answer. I think that that will be difficult. And the reason for that is the nuclear problem in the Middle East is like at the bottom of the list. I don't think anyone in the region genuinely believes there's a chance of nuclear war in the region, even if you talk to Gulf Arab states who who have worries and concerns about Iran's nuclear program, their concern will never be Iran is going to start a nuclear war or or is going to use nuclear weapons on us. That never comes up. It's more that you know we're worried about the the power or the influence that might give Iran in the region. We're worried about um, the safety and security of Iran's nuclear program, but never that it's going to actually use a potential bomb that it might have on us. So I don't think the environment is, is right for civil society to focus on this particular issue, also because there are so many other problems that they're dealing with, whether it's on a national or regional level already, that kind of feature much higher up in their list of, of grievances um, that they want to tackle. So I think, I think it will be really difficult to get them to focus on something other than the issues, the day-to-day -day issues that they're dealing with in their in their countries and in the region, um, and certainly not on nuclear power. There, there may be scope for those of us who work on non-proliferation to at least get the, our counterparts in the Middle East interested in it, which they already are, to be fair. So to, to kind of energize the movement in, in that way. But, um, but I think it will largely be an endeavor that's restricted to either experts and people that work on non-proliferation issues in the region and outside, or in a top-down way. So from officials coming from above, kind of making the decision for, for people on this particular issue. I just think it's difficult to envisage the region's civil society to be invigorated by this process when they have so much else on their plate. Thank you so much. Really fascinating. Uh, could talk a lot more. And we have done in the past, you and I, and hopefully with the pandemic gets under control, perhaps we might meet again.
But thank you so much for, for talking to us. Uh, and thank you for listening, those of you that uh, have got this far. I, I won't go through the long list of uh, social media that you can get us on, but go to our website, wmd-free.me, and, uh, and you'll find all the information there. Cheers, and uh, uh, catch you next time. Bye for now.